Hi, and thanks for joining us today. In this episode, I speak with my good friend, Peter Vass. Peter is the owner and head teacher at Team Prodigy Martial Arts in Seven Hills. Peter's been a friend of mine for some time, and uh, one of the things that really uh, fascinated me about his business was the fact that despite whatever the trend was with martial arts, he has always grown. And I feel that that's been attributed to his personality and his work ethic. In this episode, Peter describes to me what work he has put into his business and himself in order to get to the position that he's in now. Peter is in a position where his business is growing, his students are growing, and he himself is growing. This interview is different from others in that we don't really focus a lot on God, but instead we focus a lot on personal. Peter is my friend because some of the good qualities that he displays are aspirational not only for his students, but for the teachers who work for him. Stay tuned for more. Thanks for your time. You're welcome, man. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming out to the school. Well, you've got a pretty good setup here. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. How many years has it taken for you to finally get to a position like this? Um, it's taken five years. So this is our fifth year uh, operating. But um, we were ready to move in year three. It just took a bit of time to find the right space. So um, back when we were in our old location, it was smaller than this. Uh, about 200 square metres, 220 square metres. We outgrew that within the first two and a half, three years. So we got on the front foot trying to find something. Took a little bit, but we got there in the end. So now we're lucky we, we can grow into this school for a few more years. Some schools, uh, especially schools around Western Sydney, seem to stagnate at anything between 10 to 50 students. What do you think makes your plan so special to grow? Uh, look, uh, and, and you're right, there's, there's instructors that have been teaching a lot longer than I have. Um, uh, and it, look, it's a combination of things. It's not just one thing that, that makes it right or wrong or allows the school to grow. It's uh, a combination. So the, the, the way you teach, the, the, the personality you have, um, obviously your teaching skills, your reputation, your business sense in running a school, making it run efficient, making it run um, profitable, being profitable as well to be able to expand or excel. Um, there's, there's a combination of different things. Um, for us, I think the main thing, one of our main things was our culture and the culture I instilled in the school from the get-go. Um, the culture was based upon family, family, family values. So you're not just a mother when you walk into the school. You're a person, you're a face. We know you, we know how your day was. We, we, we are actually genuine, uh, genuinely want to know. Um, and that goes for the kids as well as the adults and the parents and you know, the whole family. So um, we've had cases of you know parents losing their jobs and not being able to afford training. I still allow the kids to come in and train because the kids, you know, it's an unfortunate circumstance, but we don't, we don't hinder the kids or the, the student because of other, uh, other circumstances out of their control. Um, so that's allowed us to have this family unity here at school. And that's been one of our biggest, our biggest um, points, I think. Um, during COVID, we went, um, when we went into lockdown, we had 180 families stay on board with us online, which was massive. Um, and they were all appreciative and they wanted to support us and um, us support them and, and keeping their students all the students moving forwards, even in the time of um, uncertainty, but yeah. So tell me the story from day one of your very first day of training as a student. Mm. What do you think the most, the, the memory that stands out the most from day one? Um, what, would, what would it have been? Oh, there's, there's a few, look, I, I, before, even before training, I, 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 uh, every like like every other child in their eighty in the eighties um, wanted to be like Bruce Lee, so that was my first memory of martial arts. Um, uh, you know, um, I moved forwards from that. Uh, we had a local taekwondo school down the road. Um, my parents were the you know the the, the typical hardworking parents. You know, uh, didn't really take me to training. I used to walk myself to uh, to, to training. 
Um, it was, I was lucky in the sense that it was around the corner from um, my house and I uh, walked in there and I was amazed, like seeing all these kicks and everyone camping and it was, yeah, it was good. That was probably my first memory. My instructor was an old school hard, uh, old school hard instructor. Um, so there was no, mm, the, the, it, it was a different time to say the least. It was push ups on knuckles on concrete and all the rest of it, which I, I, I loved. I loved that sort of, that, that, that discipline and, and all the rest of it. So, and the structure. I wasn't super talented, but I, I found a way to try to excel and succeed. It's interesting you bring up the word talent. Do you think talent is something that comes natural, or do you think that it's something that's acquired? It's, uh, look, it, it both. It's some people that have natural ability. Um, I didn't, I didn't have natural ability. It took a lot of hard work and a lot of years um, and sacrifice of, you know, my friends going out and I'm still training away on the mats by myself or with my training partners or wherever it was. Um, but it took me a, a, a long time to catch up. Um, and I, and I, I, saw it, I saw the progression. So we had some students in our school that were naturally talented and they were always inspiring or whatever it was. They were always, um, you know, handing my, handing my ass to me basically. And then slowly over time, I saw myself catch up to those guys and then I superseded them. And then they actually dropped out. Um, they dropped out not long after um, I, I surpassed them. I, I think that they realized that they didn't have the same work ethic as I did. Um, they had natural ability, but they didn't have the work ethic. Um, so you need both to be, um, to be able to go places, I think. How long did you stay at your first school for? I was ooh, in my teens. Uh, I took, I think, 17, 17, and I took a couple of years off. I you know, got my driver's license, I had mates, I discovered girls. So I took a couple of years off, and I had a friend of mine who actually introduced me to uh, one of my other instructors. And from there, I, I, I took off and started training again and I moved back. And have you always been in Taekwondo, or did you double in anything else? Yeah, I've done, uh, well, Taekwondo I've done for 31 years, in my 30, uh, 31st year. Um, Jiu Jitsu, I've done since 2001. Uh, Thai boxing, I've done since the early 2000s. And boxing, I've done for the last 10 years or so. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've dabbled around in all different styles, and I think it's a, it's a good way to do it. Then you pick your, pick your style. You know, Taekwondo was always my first passion, um, and that's where I competed nationally and internationally. So, um, and it'll always remain my first passion, but it has its uh, it has its strengths, but it also has, it has its weaknesses as well. Would you call yourself a purist? What do you classify a purist? As in, you teach things the way that it was taught, for example, 300 years ago? Mm, no. No? No. I, uh, I move with the times. I evolve. Uh, yeah, there's some things that do stay the same because they've worked and they st still continue to work. But there's other things that, um, you know, that, that, that need to evolve and improve. You know, for example, MMA, that's, that's become an, uh, its own martial art now. And that's been coming from all different styles. It's created one, one, uh, one unique style. So, yeah, so. So it seems that you've had the experience and uh, insight to be able to work out what works and what doesn't. So what would you say is a myth that you've been able to debunk? For or against? Either. Either. Um, that Taekwondo doesn't work in a, uh, you know, well, Taekwondo is all about flashy kicks and uh, more of the, the, the movie star kind of, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It has, it, everyone thinks it only works well in movies, but it actually doesn't. It works well in self-defense if you know, and if you've been taught well enough to implement it in that circumstance. So would you say that there's a level of understanding as opposed to a level of knowledge that you need to have to make yeah, that happen? Definitely, definitely. Um, but that, that also comes with time, comes with experience, and that'll come with, um, you know, crossing paths with other styles, like realizing, okay, Taekwondo is predominantly a, a kicking martial art. If you come up against a, a kickboxer, um, you're gonna have uh, obstacles or hurdles that you need to overcome, you need to be able to work that out. So, um, any, a lot of kickboxers and Muay Thai guys that I've, I've sparred against in training, they don't understand a lot of the footwork that goes into Taekwondo. Taekwondo's got a lot of movement and footwork and 
It's, it's um, very tactical and technical. Um, there's a lot of traps that you're setting with movement and footwork, and, um, and not a lot of guys understand that. Uh, whereas Muay Thai is very strong and powerful, which is fantastic. Um, but it misses, I think it misses an element of trickery, I guess, if you want to call it that, or setting traps for people to fall into, for you to be able to counter or to set up certain moves that, you know, that work for you. Do you think that there are any specific resources that helped you along the way in becoming a teacher and ending up in a, a basically a commercial operation as big as this? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I've had great training partners. I've had um, you know, mentors along the way. Um, uh, you know, instructors, obviously. Uh, so there's been a combination of things. It's, it's, um, you know, I've always been a young entrepreneur. You know, from a young age, I've had businesses and whatnot. So um, business, the business side of things, came natural to me. Um, so the the amalgamation of the two is, is uh, being easy as well. So I used to manage a school and um, I learned a lot from that and then you know, brought it into my own school and, and moved forward from there. What advice would you give to someone who, wanted, who wants to start their own school? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's, um, look, it's, it, it's fantastic. Um, it, it's a lifestyle change. Uh, yeah, you're, you're not just uh, coming into a business to teach martial arts, but it's a lifestyle choice. You know, um, uh, you know, I, I, I love what I do. I love teaching the kids. I love teaching you know, the adults as well. Teaching martial arts in, as a whole, but um, my life is free to come and go as I please. So for example, I can train in the morning, um, I can train in the morning, have the morning off, run around, run some errands, whatever it, is, whatever it may be, but it's a whole lifestyle um, shift and change. So I used to be in, cor in the corporate world as well. I used to be a real estate agent, believe it or not. Yeah, good luck, good luck. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I didn't enjoy it. You know, the money was great and all the rest of it, but I didn't, I didn't love it. Um, this I love. This I love seeing. I love seeing the kids succeed, move forwards, whatever the goals may be. They, you know, I try to help them achieve it. Um, whether it's learning how to do a flying kick or achieving a black belt or you know going to world championships, whatever you know, whatever it is, however small or large, that's that's my. That's my reward when I see them achieve. So what I'm hearing from you is that despite this being uh, your business and livelihood, you're not actually here and motivated by money. What you're actually motivated by is seeing the kids achieve. Yeah. So if I was a parent bringing my son or daughter here, why should I pick you as a teacher over someone else? Um, well, it's, it, it's not so much you should pick me as a teacher, it, it's the, it's the school, the environment that your your family are going to come into. So it's not just me as a, because I'm, I'm one, one aspect of this school. My instructors, my staff, um, and the other kids and students on the mats, we all create an environment that is welcoming for anybody to come into. Um, the skill set, I mean, I've, I've competed all around the world in Taekwondo and whatnot, so, um, you know, the, the skills and the credentials are there. Uh, now it's just being able to put the two together and be able to teach a kid that's three years old, that's never thrown a punch in his life, but make it enjoyable for him to do so. The same sort of deal with adults. Being able to push adults to, to their limits, knowing their limits, um, helping them achieve and move forward and seeing that, okay, a little bit of hard work, it'll get easier. Um, it, it's known to have balance to, I think. Why do you believe that it's important for a young kid to start their journey in martial arts? How, how do you see the skills that they pick up from here as something that will serve them later on? Um, the skills, I, I've always said this, two, two sports um, or styles I'll, I'll put my children if I ever, if I ever have children. Um, I know you're going to comment on that one, but um, uh, if I have children it will be swimming and martial arts. Um, swimming because uh, obviously for the safety aspect, but uh, they're individual sports. So the kids, or you know, I keep referring to kids, but I mean students, um, learn to rely on themselves. So it's not like a team sport where they have all their friends to help score a goal. Um, a, a, an individual sport, when they achieve, they achieve it on their own. Okay, so they feel proud of themselves. Um, if, if they if they don't succeed, 
and they, for example, might not pass their, 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 their grading or their, their testing for their new belt, they know that they, they need to put a little bit more hard work into it. So that will either make or break the person's um, will or want to achieve that goal. Um, so the life skills, the, 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 the discipline, the focus, the structure, I mean, I wouldn't be the person I am if it wasn't for martial arts. I, at a young age, I played a little bit of soccer, but then I went straight to martial arts. It was what I fell in love with. And I would not be the person I am today if I, if I didn't do it. Do you think it's possible to learn a martial system, a martial art, a martial science without there being structure? No, you need structure. Without structure, it's chaos. You need structure. Some sort of structure. It, it might be... Uh, a structure that uh, is a little bit broader than others, others are a little bit more you know, fine-tuned, but it, there still is always a structure. You need structure. What's your, what's your belief on that, Paul? Do you need structure? With learning? With learning. Learning in general, yes. Yeah. Learning martial arts? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. I, I'd, I'd say more often than not, but I think there's instances where the structure won't actually Serve sort of teaching at a point. For example, I believe that if there's a, a student who you would call seasoned, there comes a point where structure doesn't do anything and it turns into a learning experience where it's about understanding. And what I believe, what I mean when I say understanding is that you've got knowledge for example, in a box, and you've got to pull out all the tools in that box and you've got to understand what each of those tools does. And I think that structure won't actually allow that all the time. It don't, it um, uh, I agree 100%. And I was actually having this conversation with someone, I think yesterday, um, there is no right or wrong in martial arts. You know, the, the, it, it's what works for you as a person. So whatever you can use, let's say in a self-defense situation, whatever whatever tools you can use to defend yourself, as long as it works for you and you get home safe to your family and friends, it's, it's right. What, for example, um, uh, a jab cross, something really simple, two straight punches. If I don't know how to implement that punch properly, or those punches properly, um, and if it's not effective, then I'm not, I'm not, um, I've lost what I'm trying to say, can you, yeah, sorry. So let me get that. So, so there's no right and wrong martial arts. So it's basically what works for you and what you find effective and what you can implement to the best of your ability. Now, um, you, you know, you might be able to learn a whole bunch of kicks, but the one simple technique, a front kick, might be more effective than a jab cross, turning kick, cax kick, whatever it may be. So it's what works for you, um, you know, uh, how you implement it. It's not so much, um, it must be this way. You know, it must be turn, grab, palm, punch. No, because it's different situations call for different, different techniques, different movements, different reaction times, different distances. So you need to understand all these things and know that as long as it works for you, it doesn't matter if it looks pretty or if it doesn't. So how do you pass that on as a teacher? How do you pass on that concept to a student, whether they be eight years old or 26 years old, that the learning that you're offering them is conceptual in nature. But, uh, I think that's where it comes into the artist part of martial arts. Um, you know, you're, you're an artist, whether you're painting uh, a painting or creating something beautiful with your hands and your feet. Um, as long as it, uh, it works for you and, and it looks right to you and it's, uh, it works for you. So we allow them to have a bit of freedom in their, in their, in their <coughs> demonstrating off techniques or pad work or whatever it may be. So it's, it's, it's not, okay, you must do a jab and then follow with a turning kick. It could be whatever combination you want. These are the techniques that we've taught you guys. Try to implement them to the best of your ability. And with that time and experience, that knowledge will increase and the skill set will increase and they become their own, their own style. Do you think time on those for everyone? I think so. I think so. And, and, and not, I mean, as we get older, the, the, the high kicks and things like that might be uh, a little bit hard as we get older. Um, but there's still another asset, uh, facet to martial arts or to taekwondo that allows you to, 
to learn. So it doesn't always have to be the fancy jumping, spinning kicks. You know, there's simple techniques that will be effective, whether it's in a self-defense situation or breaking a board. Um, also, the other, the, the agility, the flexibility that comes along with it, whether they're three years old or adults, it's definitely going to come in handy to you sometime. Um, yeah, it develops the body and infrastructure as well. Develops the body in a different way. When you first started out on your own, yeah. what were some of the challenges that you faced and some of the challenges you were surprised about not facing? Um, in all honesty, I wasn't, I wasn't really nervous or, 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 or afraid of the, the outcome. I was uh, confident in my ability to run a class, run a school, and I know how to run a business. I've done them for many years. Um, so. The, the, I think the biggest surprise was how quick the school grew, um, how quick it grew, um, and again, I attribute that, attribute that to the culture and, and, and the care that we take with the students. So in the beginning, it was you that were, was just teaching? I was teaching, I was being the receptionist, I was administration, the cleaner, everything. So it's fair to say that in the beginning, reputation was everything, and it probably still is even now, is that right? Yeah, um, look, uh, so, uh, yeah, reputation is, uh, it did help, definitely. Um, a, a lot of the people that I grew up with um, in school and, uh, and after school, um, they'd seen me compete throughout the years, um, so they had faith that what I was teaching was legit. Um, so they, they've now brought their kids to me. Um, so, yeah, I've got uh, some old friends here that I bring their kids because they know what I'm going to teach them isn't just, um, you know, we're not a childcare centre. Uh, even our three-year-olds, I'm, I'm going to try to teach them the German martial arts. It's not, you know, run around and spin in circles and touch your toes and that's it. It's, I'll, I'll teach the kids proper combinations, proper techniques, how to defend themselves, build their confidence. Um, so, yeah. What do you think makes Peter Vasily different from any other two? Master Peter Vasily, my man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, uh, really, it's, uh, look, it, it, any, look, anyone can become a teacher, but to become a good teacher and uh, and for people to see that, I think it takes the the, 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 the caring, um, you know, the, the hard work, putting time into each student. Even the kids that aren't gifted, right, you need to put time in them. Uh, I've noticed, um, I've noticed uh, other instructors in the past favour certain students. I, I, I try to keep it as fair as possible um, because the, the, the child that isn't as athletically gifted as, you know, um, your, your, your freak of nature, because we've all seen them, they come in, they pick things up straight away, it's very easy to be drawn to those people to try and push them. And you do, you, you push them a little bit faster, but you can't forget about, you know, little Johnny that wants to get his back on. You can't. Because, um, you know, one day little Johnny might supersede the naturally talented um, student because he's just got that hard work ethic and needs to be able to, um, yeah, it has to have, you know, needs to work a little bit hard, but that hard work and that that um, dedication is going to supersede just the talent. Uh, if you had a young student walk in here who had zero experience in any martial art, and they came to you, and they asked you the question, "Why do you think it's important for me to get my black belt?" What would your answer be? I think first and foremost it will be um, the, the life skills that you're going to have instilled in you um, from the hard work and the, the achievements and um, yeah, the, 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 the life skills, you know, um, you know the, the, the focus, the discipline, you know, I keep going back to it, but these are qualities that you're going to be able to take in any aspect of your life, um, not just martial arts, um, you know, the respect and the courtesy, the integrity, all these things, they all make a martial artist, you know, a, a, a proper martial artist, not just, you know, uh, and this is probably one of the reasons why I don't teach ever made this. Um, it draws in a certain kind of person to the school, which um, I'm not fond of. I, I, I want to teach traditional martial arts um, in a safe, fun, easy going environment, but still have those, you know, those factors of discipline, courtesy, you know, building that confidence as well in the student. 
I want to touch on what you, um, one of the words you just mentioned there. You said a safe environment. Uh, I think now, especially in this current climate where everyone in the whole world is trying to grapple with this concept of a, a pandemic, mm. uh, everyone is focusing on personal safety. Not so much personal safety in the sense of they're scared of getting attacked if they walk down the street, but they're, they're scared of a threat. Now, you said safety. Define safety in, in the context of teaching something that requires physical contact. So there's different ways you can teach something. Um, there's, there's multiple ways you can teach one thing. Um, uh, now, whether it be coming into contact with the person, we we have different different methods that we you know we teach. Instead of using our hands to point out things or make contact with the student if they're you know to correct technique, we'll use a paddle for example, or we'll get them to mimic us, um, and we'll stand literally in front of the student until they get it right. Um, so you don't have to have contact in certain situations like this. Um, where we try to keep a, 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 bit of, a bit of distance between you know, students. But uh, yeah, there's, there's multiple different ways you can teach that doesn't, doesn't make the person feel intimidated or uh, unsafe. That brings me on to another question that I think is a, a big talking point for the martial arts community in general and always has been, which is, does that mean that today's way of teaching is different or not servant, not servient to the idea of traditional martial arts. So, in other words, there must be a difference between traditional martial arts and, for example, what you would call a modern martial art. Would you agree? A modern martial art or a sport for competition? Well, uh, either, really. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, there is there's a difference between traditional and uh, sport whether it be in jiu-jitsu or taekwondo, you know, to use them as an example. Um, uh, jiu-jitsu, for example, I'm not going to pull guard on the street and try to pull someone down. Yes, it can work, but do I have a great risk of being punched in the face? Definitely. The person doesn't necessarily have to know martial art. In jiu-jitsu, if, if it was a self-defense situation on the street, I'd want to be, end up on top, whether it be a mount or in their guard. Um, same job to do with uh, taekwondo. Taekwondo now has uh, evolved and become uh, a little bit different. So it's more about scoring points. Whereas when I was competing, it was a lot harder. It was a lot more explosive, a lot more dynamic. Um, it wasn't just about scoring points. It was almost like you're going to kick to break the person, um, even though in a sports capacity. Um, now it's a little bit more tap, tap, that kind of stuff, which, um, you know, it's not what I've grown up doing. It's the way the sport's gone. And um, it's, it's, forced us to evolve our teaching and our knowledge in martial arts and adapt to what the game's become. Now, traditional martial art, I think, is... Uh, the traditional side of it is, is definitely, I mean, you can always have that element of athleticism in the traditional martial art. Um, in what sense? What would define it? What, what would you call athleticism if you were watching a student in a traditional martial art. Yeah, being able to throw your kicks and being explosive, not just floating through the air, being more direct in your techniques. What did you call that intent? No. Was so, it? well, in my mind, if, for example, I had a target in front of me, let's say, for example, a paddle or a breaking board, mm. am I using intent to break that board or am I using athleticism? Using both. So athleticism and intent are the same thing? No, they're, they're two that make one. Two different things that will make one. So you need to be, uh, so we've had children, and so our grading system, as you get higher up the ranks, they need to break boards to pass grade. They need to break a minimum of, um, for example, um, eight out of 10 boards. So they're only allowed to miss two techniques and they only get three attempts each board. Now, um, the athleticism, you might have intent, yep, yeah, I'm gonna break this board, but you just don't have that snap or that impact power to break the board. Um, you know, and there's other kids that just naturally walk up, pop, snap the board. So uh, you need both. You need both. Um, you might have 
an athletic kid, but he just doesn't, all right, I don't, and hits off center, you know, whatever it may be. So it's a combination of things, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah. What's your favorite memory related to you teaching and running the school? Teaching? Yeah. Uh, so many. Um, I've got a student, Benjamin Kawa, he uh, won multiple, uh, multiple national titles and whatnot. His first year as a cadet. Um, Is that two child? A cadet uh, athlete. Okay. He made national team and at the same same year, so it was 2015, um, he made his national team for cadets, so 12 to 14 year olds. Um, same year I made the national team as well for the senior team. Um, so we both went to the world championships in different parts of the world. Um, that was that was something that was nice. Um, my first student walking through the door. Um, that's also another memory. Uh, her name is Tara. So and she's still with me now. And she's becoming a young lady. Uh, I used to train her sister elsewhere, and, and then she came. She came along to to Prodigy, and she was you know, my first student that walked through the door, and it was like. Oh, like I still remember that day when she walked up the stairs in a you know in a, in a white uniform. It was um, you know, a realization of something uh, that I've put some you know, put hard work into coming to fruition. But there's been heaps. There's been honestly, there's been heaps. There's, I could name you fifty of them. So going back a um, couple of years, there was um, a sad incident where. Uh, one of the students that was here lost his life. Mm. Obviously, it happened outside of the school. Um, how did that impact on you and the rest of the students here? Mm, yeah, sad day, that one. Um, Julian. So, um, yeah, if you don't know or know the story, he, um, he was overseas in Spain. Um, unfortunately, there was uh, a terror attack. He got hit by a, by a car or, or a van. He unfortunately lost his life. Um, his mum that was with him uh, survived, still has uh, all these all these injuries and, and one other she's always in hospital with. Um, when the news came, it was it was a massive shock. It was it was like it wasn't even real. Um, we we banded together as a as a team and as a family um, financially to help help out the family. Um, they had a whole bunch of medical bills and, and whatnot. So in the space of two weeks, we turned it, um, uh, uh, that situation, we tried to create a, a positive out of it, I guess, if you want to call it that, where we banded together, we got a whole bunch of um, uh, retailers, yourself included, um, came together, we had uh, martial arts demos, it was all to raise money, um, all, to, all to raise money for the family. So the way that, and how quick and how every, everyone was so willing to jump on board and help and lend a hand, whether it was five minutes or five hours of their time, um, it really it, it, it showed how how close we were as a family. That if, if one person suffered, we all felt it. Um, yeah, so that was probably the, the, the one of the biggest things. That was it was it was amazing to see how everyone came together and um, did their bit. So what? What I took away from um, that event on the day um, was number one, the, the success that you had from it. And I measured that by the amount of people that turned up. I remember specifically there were more people than what I thought there even be. There were hundreds. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything else that I could say about that day was that in my experience being in um, a, the martial arts community within Sydney, is that you you stood out because you basically were a person of sound judgment and uh, values. You 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 have um, what's the word I'm looking for? You've got a you've got a good character. Thanks. Do you think? <laughs> do you? Do you think that that's important for a teacher? Uh, no doubt, yeah. it's, it's important for a human being, let alone a teacher. I mean, you, you judge on your character when you first meet someone. So, you know, that, that impression and, and, and that character just comes out naturally. So I think if you have bad intentions or a bad character or bad values, that, is, that shows as well. 
What do you think that does for martial arts in general? Because I know that there are a lot of teachers out there that, for lack of a better word, are emotional dwarves. These are people that basically with a, a current or almost immediate... Um, these are people who are, are known criminals, yeah. so to speak. And these are people who, realistically, you wouldn't leave your kid with them, but yet yeah, they're running yeah, schools. But, but at the same time, you can't judge like that as well. Um, look, I, I, we, we've all got past. I've got a past, but that was many, many years ago. Ten years ago, actually. Um, but you can't be judged on one mistake that you've made. Okay? Um, so, you know, I, I made a mistake many, many years ago and um, vowed never to, to, to get down that path ever again and, and corrected my life. And, and I think a lot of that was attributed to martial arts and, and remembering my martial arts and the values that were instilled in me. Um, you know, we, we've all led astray from, you know, the straight, straight and narrow. Um, so, yeah, not so much, um, you know, if they've got a, a past, that's okay, as long as they're, they're not that person now. That's different. If they're that person now and they're still in that, uh, you know, that circle of, uh, or they have that circle of friends, or they're moving around in those kind of uh, those areas, then you can okay, you wouldn't leave your kids with them. But if it's something they made a mistake, you know, a single mistake years ago, forget about it, push it aside. As long as they're not that person currently. The, the future of Taekwondo, um, where do I see it going? <sighs> oh, it's a good one. Look, um, the way it's moved forward, it's, it's gone away from being a martial artist and being an athlete. Similar to MMA, like there's a lot more athletes now over martial artists. Um, I used to love watching people like Anderson Silva, one of my favorite athletes, or uh, sorry, favorite martial artists. Um, compete because he had that traditional style that implemented uh, that he implemented into my, um, MMA, um, and it was beautiful to watch. Now you've got MMA guys that are learning bits and pieces from everywhere and trying to put it together and, and being successful at it too. It's not that it's not successful; it's um, they're not they you know they're almost like jack, jack of all trades, master of none, that kind of thing. Um, Yeah, I've, I've gone off the question, but the future of Taekwondo, if it keeps moving forward the way it is, um, for the competition side of it, the, the, the traditional side, as we call it, is fantastic. The, the, the sports side of it has turned, um, it's, it's, it's... Political? No, look, there's always politics, politics and everything, but it, it's turned softer. It's not uh, as dynamic and explosive. It's, you know, the, 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 the techniques that we teach in, in, in competition, could you use them in uh, a self-defense situation? Possibly. Take it back 10 years ago, and the techniques that you learn in competition, you'd definitely be able to use them. Why? Why? Because they were, they were there to hit and, you know, hurt the opponent not just score a point. Now it's more about scoring points than, um, you know, um, imposing your will. So what you've just brought up is something that I feel is really important because I'm of the opinion that there are a lot of styles, arts, systems, whatever label you want to give to them, that advertise quite loudly that they teach self-defense, yeah. when in actual fact what they're doing is teaching the student how to commit suicide in a long, drawn-out, painful way. How, how so? Well, I've been in training for at least 12 years. Yep. Yeah. Um, the teacher that I had was, what's the word I could use? He was different. And he exposed me to a way of thinking that I honestly didn't know about. And it what, caused me to, what, what you thinking? Well, it caused me to question a lot. Question a lot about what people said they did and what they actually did. Now, specifically what I'm talking about, and not, not taking a dig at anyone in specific, but 
I know a few Taekwondo schools where they openly say we teach self-defense and when you when I, I've walked in and I've asked the question, can you show me what it is exactly you're teaching? And from my knowledge and my expertise, what they teach is not self-defense. And it's not because there's a lot that's not taken into account. Like? Specifically, my opinion of self-defense is do what needs to be done and then get to safety. That also means taking into account environment. So although I might, for example, as a student, be able to pull off a technique, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm going to survive because for all I know, whoever I'm defending myself against has three mates standing behind me that I'm not aware of. Mm. Now, sure, I'm going to pull off the kick and the punch and the headlock and whatever else, but as soon as I turn around, my face is going to get smashed by whoever's behind me. Yeah, martial arts, as far as I'm aware, uh, it, it um, also teaches you to be aware of your surroundings. So, at any time I've been caught in a confrontation, my my first instinct isn't to go in and uh, defend. My first instinct is to take a step back, make myself aware of the situation, and then react. So, react or act? React. Why I'm, react? React because I'm reacting to his his aggression, his threat towards me. Um, that's why it's. You're, you're defending yourself, self-defense. Otherwise, you're the attacker, right? Or you're the bully. But uh, as, uh, my, my first instinct is never to go, so take a step back, see if you can defuse it, assess the situation, and then, and it all happens that quick, you know? Uh, it has to happen that quick. Um, so, you know, different, different teachers have different styles, I guess, but, um, yeah, you, you need to make your, your, your students aware of what's going on around them. Uh, even if there's no threat, for example, walking down the street and you have two guys in front of you walking towards you um, or a mum pushing a stroller down the street, which one are you going to be more aware of that there's a threat? Obviously the two guys. So you take that into account. So knowing and not just, you know, um, Knowing, knowing, you know your surroundings, your, your, your potential threats, and your immediate threats. Um, you know, uh, it, it's a, it's a little bit maybe parallel, but anytime I go into a, a restaurant or a cafe, I never like to have my back turned to a crowd. I, I always like to be up against the wall, sitting and where I can observe everything and anyone around me. Some people would call that tiring. Would you agree? No, with that? not at all. Not at all. Why is it tiring? It's not. It's not a. It's not a. It's a subconscious thought. It's, I, I know where I want to sit. I never want to have my back to, to anything. And it's not because I'm afraid, but I'm just aware that you know, there's always threats, no matter how small or large, you know, especially in this day and age, you know, with you know, terrorists and people being stabbed. And, oh, you just, you don't always be aware. Because unfortunately we live in a society that there aren't a lot of, you know, there aren't, you know, not everyone is nice and polite and, you know, there's some bad people out there, so you need to take the measure, you know, the measured steps to make sure that, you know, you, you go home and you fit me. So if you were teaching a student any, any type of learning module where you're going to basically empower the student to make good decisions in, in the context of protecting themselves, mm -hmm. how does it start? How, what, what's the overall message you're trying to teach them? Is it go out into the world but be aware? Or is it don't even bother walking down that lane Go out in the world. Um, observe the world, but know that there are always dangers that could be around the corner. So you, you need to, you know, you, you can't just fall into you know, an inch and trust someone instantly. You need to assess that person. I said, that person on their, their moves, their behaviors, their characters, their tones, whatever it may be. But know that, you know, there's a, a whole bunch of good people in this world. And there's only, you know, it might be a, yeah, a few, few bad ones, but you might come across those bad ones. So you just need to, you know, 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 know the difference and know what, you, what your, um, your surroundings are and, and, and yeah. 
it's, it's look, for, for us, for example, we'll, we'll get, when a, when a child prays for their black ball, um, they have to spar against two people at once. Um, and people are like, oh, but we know that, you know, they're going to be coming into, yeah, it's, it, we look for a couple of different reasons. One, to show, for, for that student to demonstrate their mental fortitude to be able to compete or, or defend himself or herself against two people, but also know how to uh, create a barrier of some sort or uh, know how to position yourself in that kind of circumstance. You never want to have a person behind you. You always want to keep them in front, so it's almost like a triangle. Okay, yourself, either attacker or whatnot, or move around one attacker and you know, use one as their shield so you're only fighting one. So there's different, different, um, different concepts, but yeah, you go back in the world, enjoy it, because it's a beautiful place, but know that there's always going to be, there could, could always be dangers around, you know, around every corner. And I meant to scare you, Paul. Would you, uh, if a student came to you and said, oh, I want to learn how to fight, would you, would you be upfront with them or would you make it clear to them that there's a difference between learning self-defense and there's a difference between learning the sport? Uh, first of all, I'd actually have parents come into the school and say, I want my kid to be a killer. I, I stop the parent right there um, because before we, want, before, we, before we teach them the martial arts um, or alongside of it, we want them to become good people. So, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a bad child. I think there might be bad parenting, or bad uh, outside influences. So we, we always try to nurture that, that behavior that it becomes, you know, look after one another, help one another, that kind of attitude. Yes, you're going to learn self-defense, and yes, if someone attacks you, by all means, defend yourself. Um, but to go out and become, uh, you know, become a, a killer or a bully, I, 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 don't, I don't allow it in my school. Where do you think the, the desire for protecting oneself comes from? Do you think it, do you think it, it always comes from an external influence or do you think that there's something that stems from within a person to want that? Yeah, I, I think some people have naturally got that um, that what's the word I'm looking for? It's some people that are uh, just natural carers that will want to, whether it's themselves or the, you know friends or family, they want to look after and be able to protect. Um, but uh, you know, outside influences. Sometimes parents. Sometimes they've been bullied. They've had issues at school. They don't know how to. Um, they don't know how to deal with it. So. Martial arts is sometimes a, an option. It's always an option, but you know, the, the, whether they understand or realise that, that it's an option. So, basically what I'm, I'm hearing from you is that you're preparing a, a student to be able to put up their hands and throw a punch or a kick or whatever it may be if it means they're, they're going to get out of trouble, 100%. so to speak. 100%. So, I'm, I've got a different opinion on that. Mm -hmm. And well, I believe that the desire for someone to want to protect themselves and those that they love, external influences definitely play a part in it, but ultimately it's always coming from an internal source. And I believe that that internal source always comes from, uh, from faith, faith in self, faith in something other than themselves. It could be faith in their family. It could be even faith in God. So I don't think that anyone who is serious about the study of self-protection or self-defense can really escape that that responsibility, so to speak, of faith. Yeah, I, uh, look, I, I don't disagree. I don't completely. I mean, yeah, it's 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 that's an outside influence, is it not? I don't think so. I, I don't think faith. Well, they, they have to be. They have to be made aware of what their faith is. For example, you you say faith in God. You need to go to church to understand what God is all about, or you need to read a book, or read the Bible. Or, so you need. A, it, it's an outside influence, isn't it? It could be. It is. 
No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Some people, no, some, some, some people. Look, I, I, I've, I've always been a caring person. When I was young, I, I, I've never been a nasty person, but pushed in the right circumstance or the wrong circumstance, I would protect myself and my family with no questions asked. But my natural characteristic is to help someone first. If I can't help them um, and, and they still are trying to, or they are trying to cause harm to me, then I'll protect myself. But I will try to help them and, 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 and stop that. Um, that, that threat, if so that makes sense. How do, you deal with, how do you personally deal with that complexity of, simply put, being cruel to be kind? You, you're, in effect, you're using violence to stop, or you're using violence to care for someone. How do you, how do you get around that thought process? Because if I don't do it in a measured, controlled way, someone else is going to do it in a much worse way. You know, it, it, you know, for example, you've got youth these days that are very quick to mouth off or, you know, write stuff on Facebook and Instagram and all the rest of it, but, and if I don't, you know, it's going to sound long camera, but if I don't give him a clip around the ears, someone else can put a knife in his stomach because he's just upset the wrong person. So if I don't pull, you know, a, a, a friend up because he's overstepping the line in the way of matters or, you know, whatever, it's just that loud mouth, um, it could end up much worse for him. And whose responsibility is that? Is it the teacher's? Because the teacher was the one that put the idea in their head that... You know, you, you have to be a good, good person to be, be able to be a good teacher because if you've got anger and you're teaching out of anger, and you, the kids will absorb that. So... How can you tell a teacher's teaching out of anger? Because they're just so, everything's so aggressive and not, it's not, uh, th th there's not a lot of thought process, it's just walk in the face. You know what I mean? It's, it's, the, the, the teaching or what they're teaching is, uh, is not always. Uh, so I, I, know, I know of schools where a teacher will do that and the argument they'll put forward is, well, in effect, this is like a lab and the real experiment is going to be outside because that's exactly what's going to happen outside. What would you say to that? Yeah, but it, it, no doubt that you don't have to teach hatred. That you don't have to teach, okay, everyone's an enemy. They're an enemy or a threat when they approach you in a certain way. So you don't walk out in the street thinking, okay, I can, knock every, I, I can punch every single one of those, knock their teeth out and whatnot. It's not, not the right thought process. That's when it's that's when it's tiring. Going back to making you know, what you said earlier about me being aware of certain situations or um, conscious of it. That will be tiring. Me walking down the street thinking, okay, I can oh walk out and punch people in the face and be done with it. That's why well, just go and enjoy life. Life's a beautiful, it's a beautiful place, this world. Enjoy it. Yeah. So from what I've learned today is that you, you're trying to make the lives of those students a lot better. Now, it's very honourable and noble of someone to want to do that. What do you see the future is for you in the next five years? Do you want to build on that? Of course, of course, yeah. Um, I want to build on it. I, I, I want to have five years from now. Um, so the plan is to open up multiple locations, um, have instructors helping me teach. Um, no matter how big I get as in the way of school or how many students I have, I still want to be in touch with the students because that's why I started teaching. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, mul yeah, multiple locations, being able to teach, you know, the martial arts, I, I, I'd love to get athletes to to the Olympic Games one day maybe, okay, create that opportunity for them. There's a few, there's a few different ones. So I've got one last question for you. Ask that, If time and money weren't a problem, how would you change the world? Time and money weren't a problem. Well, it, I think I'd still be teaching martial arts because teaching and, and, and creating good, good human beings, I, I, I think, from whether they're three or thirty, um, or helping enrich their lives, 
with martial arts, I think, is a great way to go about it. You know, there's not one thing that you can do to change the world. It's multiple things. Everyone does their bit, it all works.